Stephen Davis was born in Montgomery, Alabama in 1952 and moved to Pensacola, Florida the following year. He graduated from high school there in 1970 and later attended Pensacola Junior College, graduating in 1985. Stephen never married or had children, but he was very close with his family, including his mother and two sisters, and visited them frequently. He was very friendly and willing to help any and everyone. He had a lot of compassion for others and helped numerous people quit using drugs. He liked spending time with people, which led to him becoming a cab driver. Just before 4 a.m. on August 26, 1998, Stephen had just finished a 12-hour shift driving his cab. He pulled into the parking lot of a Winn-Dixie grocery store on Navy Boulevard in Pensacola. As he was getting ready to leave, someone came up to his cab and shot Stephen three times, striking him once in the jaw and twice in the back. Stephen got out of the vehicle, tried to call for help, and collapsed. He died where he fell. Stephen's yellow station wagon was taken and then later recovered nearby. The driver's window had been shattered and the driver's door and the rear passenger door were left open. Police found a single fingerprint in a globule of Stephen's blood at the scene, but were not able to match it at the time because they were not able to see the print in clear enough detail. They tried examining it multiple times over the years, and investigators held multiple cold case symposiums before technology advanced to the point where the fingerprint could be properly examined and identified. On March 5, 2024, Escambia County Sheriff Chip Simmons announced that 44-year-old Donald Holmes II is being charged with Stephen's murder after his fingerprint was matched to the one found at the crime scene. Holmes is currently incarcerated at Mayo Correctional Institution Annex in Mayo, Florida. He is serving a 20-year sentence after being found guilty of robbery, fleeing and eluding, and aggravated assault in 2014. He had previously served 17 months in prison for felony fleeing and eluding law enforcement. He was previously set for release on July 31st, 2032, but could receive life without parole if he is convicted of Stephen's murder. He was just 18 years old at the time of Stephen's murder. Stephen's mother, June Wilburn, passed away in 2007 without ever learning who killed her son. His sisters, Ruby Kastner and Julie MacArthur, were both present at the press conference announcing that Holmes is being charged with their brother's murder. Twenty-four-year-old Kelly Workman was over six feet tall and had a slight but athletic frame. She kept very close to home, very rarely straying too far from her family's dairy farm in rural Douglas County, Missouri. According to Kelly's family, she was extremely shy, naive, and had trouble socializing. In recent years, now that the disorder is more widely understood, they have come to believe that Kelly may have had some form of autistic spectrum disorder. She was very reliant on her parents and never moved out of their home. Kelly did not smile very often, both because she was shy and because she was self-conscious over her crooked front tooth. Kelly was wary of people she did not know, but enjoyed helping others, so long as she was familiar with them. Kelly was hardworking and meticulous, and independent enough to work outside of the house. She worked Sundays at a small country store, and she did yard work and cleaned houses for various family friends who lived in the small community of Dogwood. On the evening of June 30th, 1989, Kelly was mowing the lawn at the Dogwood Cemetery near the Pleasant Southern Baptist Church. This job had been passed down through several generations of her family, and Kelly had performed it for the past three years. She took the job very seriously, spending two days at a time making sure the grass around each grave marker was trimmed perfectly. Kelly's grandparents and her baby brother were all buried at the cemetery. Kelly was last seen alive at 5.40 when her uncle saw her working in the graveyard as he drove past it. At 6.15, someone who lived nearby found the lawnmower Kelly had been using unattended in the cemetery. Only a third of the grass had been mowed. There was no sign of Kelly.
Kelly's parents were immediately alarmed. It was obvious that Kelly had not left the cemetery alone or on her own accord. Kelly's car was still in the parking lot with its keys in the ignition. Her purse with $100 in cash was at home. Kelly was very wary of strangers. She did not even like talking to motorists who pulled off of the highway to ask for directions at the church. She would not have willingly left the cemetery with anyone she did not know. The search for Kelly therefore began that evening, with 50 people quickly joining the effort, searching for her on foot, on horseback, and by helicopter. Extensive searches continued for nearly a week. Then, on July 7th, Kelly's body was discovered in a creek in the Mark Twain National Forest near Oldfield, more than 10 miles away from where she was last seen. Two of Kelly's uncles were with the search party that located her body, and even decades later, they cannot bring themselves to talk about the experience. Investigators believe that Kelly was killed on the night of her disappearance, June 30th, or early in the morning of July 1st. However, since her body had been submerged in water and temperatures had been so warm, her remains had decomposed very quickly, making it difficult to see any injuries or conclusively determine her cause of death. She also had to be identified by her dental records. More than 400 people came to Kelly's funeral, with 300 of them crammed into the wooden pews of the funeral chapel and 100 others who could not fit inside, sitting or standing in the lobby for the service. Kelly was then buried at the cemetery where she had last been seen alive. On February 21, 2024, the Douglas County Sheriff's Department and Christian County Sheriff's Department had a press conference at the church near that cemetery. There, they announced that three men, Bobby Lee Banks, Leonard Dwight Banks, and Wiley Belt, had been arrested after being indicted on charges of first-degree murder, forcible rape, and first-degree kidnapping in connection to Kelly's case. According to Douglas County Prosecuting Attorney Matthew Weatherman, the arrests were finally made after a witness came forward with rock-solid testimony that tied their case together. While it took nearly 35 years for the arrests to be made, at least two of the accused, the Banks brothers, were identified in the investigation within a year of Kelly's murder. Recent statements from prosecutors indicate that the third man who has been indicted, Wiley Belt, was also a top suspect early on, despite a lack of media coverage over the investigation into him. Dwight Banks took and passed a polygraph in the summer of 1990. Around that same time, an ex-girlfriend of Bobby Banks told police that he had asked her to falsely provide an alibi for him for the night of Kelly Workman's murder, as he did not have one. Bobby took a polygraph administered by the Missouri State Highway Patrol and failed it. In July of 1995, a local newspaper published an article on the case, which resulted in police receiving a tip and the investigation picking up again. That same month, Dwight Banks gave an interview to that local paper. He gave his own account of the evening of June 30th, 1989, and acknowledged that he had been questioned by police. He also said that on multiple occasions, he had made jokes about Kelly's murder while he was drunk. In 1999, police obtained warrants to collect DNA samples from two suspects, one of whom was Dwight Banks. They had hoped that DNA could be identified from the crime scene evidence and be compared to these samples, but nothing ever came of this avenue of investigation. All three of the accused have filed for a change of venue for their trials. This has been granted for Dwight Banks and Wiley Belt. Bobby Banks' motion is still to be heard in court. All three were initially held on $250,000 cash bond. Wiley Belt's lawyers successfully had this converted to a personal surety bond, and he was able to secure his release from custody while he awaits trial. He is currently under house arrest with GPS monitoring. Dwight Banks is attempting to also secure pre-trial release on the basis of his medical needs. Belt is next due in court on June 4th, and the Banks brothers both have motion hearings scheduled for April 17th. Thirty-one-year-old Valerie Ames 
loved spending time outdoors, mainly camping and riding horses. She loved her two young daughters, Pamela and Michelle, even more. The last memory Michelle has of her mother was sitting on her lap at her fifth birthday party, a Barney the Dinosaur-themed celebration. Michelle and nine-year-old Pamela then went on a trip to England with their grandmother and never saw their mother again. Valerie's body was discovered on August 10th, 1996, in a pool of blood. She had been beaten and stabbed to death. Her body was found inside of an apartment at the Courtyard Apartments on King Street in Jacksonville, Florida. However, it was not Valerie's apartment. The man who lived there had been arrested the previous night. His daughter had come to check on his apartment and discovered Valerie's body. Since the resident of the apartment was in police custody at the time of the murder, he was cleared as a suspect. He had no connection to Valerie and did not recognize her when he was shown a picture of her. Valerie lived in the suburban neighborhood of Arlington and did not have a car. There was no known reason for her to have been in that area of Jacksonville, or obvious means by which she had gotten there, indicating that her killer had brought her to the temporarily vacant apartment, which had been left unlocked following its occupant's arrest. One of Valerie's daughters told investigators that three months before her mother was killed, she had reported being assaulted by a police officer. Nothing ever came of the charge, and nothing ever came of the lead. Valerie's case went cold. Her daughters grew up, and Valerie eventually had six grandchildren, who never got the chance to meet her. On April 2, 2024, just over 10,000 days after Valerie was killed, Jacksonville Sheriff T.K. Waters announced that 69-year-old Jerry Phillips of North Carolina had been arrested and was being accused of second-degree murder and sexual battery in connection with Valerie's case. He was facing prosecution by the Florida State Attorney's Office. Because of the ongoing criminal proceedings, the Sheriff's Office is unable to release many details about how Phillips came to be identified. According to State Attorney Melissa Nelson, more information will be made available to the media once Phillips has been indicted and their evidence against him has been formally filed in discovery, making it available to Phillips' attorneys. Sheriff Waters did say that the identification was made due to both the dedicated investigative efforts of the detectives in the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office Cold Case Unit, as well as advances in technology. He also stated that Phillips was not a total stranger to Valerie, although he could not comment on how exactly she knew him. Valerie's mother June was still alive to see the arrest made in her daughter's case and sent a statement to be read at the press conference where it was announced. Valerie's daughter Michelle was present at the press conference and gave a statement that said in part, these long years have done nothing to numb the pain of her non-existence. Her pain and her torture have all become our pain and torture daily. Standing here today, almost 28 years later, we now have some answers on our beautiful mother Valerie, and she has finally reached her chance to have justice. May our mom finally rest in peace.